Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Menke from Cortex Services. I want to thank everyone for joining today. We're now three minutes after the hour, so we're going to get started. We've given everyone a chance to, uh, to log in, so, uh, so we're going to get started. I want to start with a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, everyone on the line is muted, but we do want to get your feedback and your questions, so you should have a chat window that you can use. Feel free to use that for any questions that you want to ask, and we'll address those at the end of the webinar today. Also at the end of uh, today's webinar, we'll be sending everybody via email uh, the case study that we're going to be talking about today, as well as a link to the recording, which will be on the Cortex Services website. So I believe that's all the housekeeping items. And uh, with that, I'd like to get started with the, uh, the webinar. So today we're going to be talking with Dale Atkins, the technical architect at Munson Medical Center, about their journey on implementing a virtual clinical workstation and how zero-click access improves patient care there. So uh, to introduce Dale, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about Dale. Dale is the technical architect for Munson Medical Center here in Traverse City, Michigan. He has a master's degree in management from Lesley College and a bachelor of science degree in computer applications from Arkansas State University. Dale has been with Munson since September of 2009 Prior to joining Munson, he held management positions at private and government organizations, as well as a senior IT consultant specializing in Active Directory, server, and network technologies. Dale has been in the information technology profession for over 20 years. His professional accomplishments include multiple Microsoft, Cisco, and Citrix industry certi certifications. He also holds a Level 3 Special Professional Certificate, the Library of Michigan. Dale and his wife, Cheryl, live in Williamsburg, Michigan. Dale retired as a major in the United States Air Force Reserve with over 20 years of service. And for that, Dale, I salute you. He enjoys reading, recreational boating, and gardening, although he admits that he hasn't seen his boat since uh, snow started falling around last uh, September or so. So, Dale, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us today. Thank you very much, Cindy. I appreciate that. All right. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Great to be here, too, in, uh, in beautiful Traverse City. So I'm trying to click to the next screen. Here we go. So we want to start out by talking about what is a virtual clinical station, You know, because uh, the whole case study was kind of centered around that. So for the folks in the audience, I want to kind of frame what that is. So a virtual clinical workstation by Cortex Services definition is an infrastructure that supports automated uh, meaningful use workflows for the doctors and the clinicians. It includes uh, super fast login times to get to a productive desktop of less than five seconds uh, in subsequent taps. Usually the first tap of the day is a little bit longer, about 20 seconds or so. But once someone is into the system, uh, they should be able to easily go from desktop to kiosk to, to any sort of device within five seconds. It includes a roaming desktop to any device, anywhere, anytime, so a, a true personalized custom desktop that follows any doctor or clinician anywhere they go in the network and out of the network. It includes single sign-on to all, all applications. It includes uh, follow me printing. And, uh, uh, and what it does really provide is significant productivity increases for the doctors and clinicians because they don't have to log into multiple applications anymore um, and have to remember multiple passwords and whatever. So uh, in, in short, it will give a doctor clinician usually between 45 minutes, an hour and a half back in their, in their day. Um, time savings because they're not logging into multiple systems multiple times over and over and over throughout their day. So Dale, can you tell us a little bit about how this virtual clinical um, workstation affected your staff? Sure. Um, some of the things that we have been looking at for a number of years are ways to reduce our ongoing support costs in terms of our desktops and our software and managing uh, those endpoints for our users uh, more efficiently. So over the last few years, we've taken a look at virtualizing our, our environment. And we've done that pretty much on the server side uh, of things. Uh, we are almost entirely virtualized on, on our servers. But we haven't really done anything on the desktop. And that was the next place where we wanted to look and see how we can reduce costs in those areas. And so that brought us to the whole idea of a virtual clinical workstation where we could focus our efforts on our clinicians um, and their daily work and how we can better support them while at the same time reducing our overall costs. 
So the virtual clinical workstation, as we begin looking at it, uh, is going to help us in a number of different areas. It's going to help us reduce the device count. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that later, but we think that uh, uh, by deploying these virtual clinical workstations, uh, we call them tap and go stations, TIG uh, for short, we can uh, eliminate or reduce the number of devices we have deployed out there, perhaps as much as uh, 33 percent. A very significant reduction since our staff are no longer, if you will, camping on a device. They're able to room and, and take their desktop with them from device to device. It's also going to help us in terms of our PC replacement. We have well, we have over 6,000 PCs in our environment today, uh, which uh, around 500 or so are good candidates for this virtual environment. And uh, so the ability to elongate those old PCs, if you will, uh, and uh, keep them uh, or have them in place for another three to four or five years even uh, beyond the normal replacement cycle is going to you know, immediately save us uh, a significant amount of money. And then I'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, and that is uh, reducing our software licensing costs. Um, uh, Microsoft Office is our, our standard business office platform as well as other software that we use. We needed to find ways to reduce those ongoing uh, annual costs and one of the ways that we are doing that is by virtualizing our, our workstation. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we are going about doing that uh, in, for Microsoft software in particular uh, as we, we talk a little bit later. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Dale. So let's talk a little bit about Munson Medical Center and the way, the reason that we at Cortex Services like to uh, talk about Munson is because you're very um, indicative of, of the healthcare organizations that we see across the whole United States. So let me talk a little bit about that. First of all, you're headquartered here in Traverse City, Michigan. And for those of you who don't know what that is, Traverse City is a beautiful town on the water, Lake Michigan in Upper Michigan, and it serves a, a big tourist com uh, community. And that tourist community is year-round, uh, but it also spans across five counties. So you have one county that um, has higher income, uh, a bigger population, uh, tourists year-round, but then the other four counties really counterbalance that because they're very low population, uh, a lower um, income level, and so what happens then in, inside of your hospitals is that um, you're seeing more patients, but, uh, but paybacks are less, and so margins are down. So very typical of what we see of healthcare across the whole U.S. that we're hearing over and over again from our healthcare customers that they have to do more with less because of those factors that are uh, hitting everybody. Uh, your total user count, I think you said five or 6,000, number of providers out of that number, about 3,600. Uh, you use uh, Cerner, and what's unique about uh, you folks there is that your Cerner is hosted internally, which kind of gives us some more leverage in being able to do some cool automated workflows, which we'll talk more about later. So your meaningful use stage right now is at uh, two, and your MRAM is uh, stage five. That's correct, yep. And then uh, just to expand upon that just a bit, Cindy, um, we do a number of other things besides supporting uh, just our main facility. We also support and host a number of uh, EMRs for other private practices and other hospitals as well. Uh, we support uh, NextGen, ECW, eClinical Works, uh, and Meditech for, for these other entities, uh, as well as two other hospitals, we provide all of their IT support. They're not Munson hospitals, if you will, Munson Healthcare, but they are hospitals that contract with us for all IT support. So besides our main campus, we have two other entities that are directly related uh, or integrated into Munson Healthcare, and then two more hospitals that we provide IT support and then additional probably 50 or more private practices that we host uh, various uh, EMRs for them uh, internally to us. So um, kind of a big operation for being uh, kind of far north in uh, northern Michigan. You're right. So that is really unique in, in uh, the caliber of the IT staff that you have here. So how big is your IT staff? Total uh, count for IT and it, it, a lot of people do their IT differently, but we have about 130 that we would consider I, IT professionals. Um, that includes switchboard, help desk, install teams, uh, server, working, and so forth. And we know from working with you folks that they're a high caliber group of folks, too. All right, so Dale, let's talk about, you know, this was a 
probably a two or three year journey for you guys. I remember talking to some of your, your folks a couple years ago. And uh, when you were telling your story, it kind of went back a couple years too. But you, where you found, uh, you, what your initial state was, if you can tell us about that, and what started you down this journey. Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. I, I arrived here, as Cindy said, about four years ago, a little over four years ago now. And one of the things that we began looking at not too long after I got here is the whole idea of virtualizing our desktop environment, primarily our clinical environment, but we're also taking a look at the business side of things as well human resources, finance, and accounting, and so forth. And over uh, the, the last couple of years, uh, we have looked at a number of different technologies that uh, we wanted to try out and see how they fit into uh, our existing infrastructure and, and how they would work in terms of a virtualized environment for our end users. And we had a number of fits and starts, uh, quite honestly. We had uh, a number of uh, proof of concepts that we spun up and for whatever reason they, they just didn't work out, they didn't meet our needs, perhaps we didn't architect the solution quite right, or the technology itself wasn't quite ready for it at the time that, uh, for things that we would want to do. So uh, it's been, uh, been an ongoing process for the last four years uh, for us and it wasn't until uh, the last uh, year and a half or so that uh, we felt that the technologies began to mature enough and we got a better feeling for what our users were really after uh, that uh, we could begin putting together a, um, a virtual clinical workstation that really made sense uh, in our environment. So, you know, in terms of the technologies that uh, we had, uh, we looked at a number of different card readers and uh, uh, proximity cards and storage solutions and software. So a lot of different uh, technologies out there, but none of them at the time uh, really would work together that the way we wanted to do it in a seamless environment that was relatively low maintenance, um, that uh, was easily expandable. Uh, those were some of the requirements that we had when we sat down and talked about the whole virtual clinical desktop. Uh, we've also had, you know, significant issues with application integration. Now, probably true of any hospital out there, we have dozens if not, well, dozens of major applications and hundreds of ancillary applications that all need to work together in some form or be supported in various environments, whether it's a virtual environment or a desktop environment. And that's been a huge uh, issue for us as well in terms of desktop support is managing all of these different applications. So how are we going to do that in a virtual environment if we're having difficulty in a desktop environment as well? So we were looking for tools and technologies that would help us uh, virtualized applications uh, where we could uh, to support this kind of an environment. Our users, which was interesting, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit uh, in, the, in the slide presentation, our users often viewed our technology as a hindrance to their job. Uh, and we needed to find a way to overcome that and to make our technology, what we provided from an IT perspective, usable for them in aiding and improving the way they did their job, not as the, another uh, technology that we throw out there and they have to use it and then try and find ways around it if it doesn't work quite well with their workflow or it just doesn't work well at all in terms of um, stability or uh, performance or whatever. So that was, uh, that was kind of an eye-opening thing for us. And then the other thing that was uh, kind of unique, or maybe not unique, but uh, certainly surprising was our clinicians, including our nursing staff, don't really use the laptops and carts that we had placed out there for them, both in the rooms, the patient rooms, as well as uh, mobile carts that they could roll around to wherever they needed to, hardly at all. And there were a number of reasons for that. Mainly it was because the methods that we provided for them to access and use those laptops and carts and the applications on them was simply too slow and too cumbersome. So the bottom line is, is we were pretty much in the dark um, in, as far as our, our uh, clinical users were concerned. We, we thought we knew what they wanted. Uh, we tried to provide what it is that they needed, but in the, uh, in the end we realized that we simply were not giving them the solutions and the tools that they needed to really be effective in, in their job, and that is caring for the patients and making sure that their patients are um, 
seen and provided for in, in the way that uh, the, the providers and the clinicians expected. Bottom line is, is, is uh, we needed to do our desktop uh, management system completely differently. And, and so that really began the journey about a year and a half ago in, in a serious manner uh, for us to, uh, to fix that. Quite an epiphany moment when you say we realized we were failing our users. That probably was the turning point, huh? It really was, and that didn't come just from uh, from me or or uh, it came from a number of, of folks who were out there doing some initial assessments of, of the desktop environment. And uh, when we gathered back together one day and, and compared notes and uh, began seriously designing uh, what we needed to do from a desktop, that was the common theme: is we failed, or we were failing our users, and we needed to fix that. And that was, that's been the driving focus of this whole project, is to make sure that we don't fail our users again. Amen. So that started the need for change. And uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit because, again, it's very, what you guys went through here at Munson is very indicative of what we see across the entire United States. First of all, and I mentioned this in the first slide, from the CEO and CIO perspective, that financial challenges continue to top the list of concerns at that level. And again, having it's the first time we've heard it in healthcare. Like we can all remember back to the you know recession 2008, 2009, and across all the other verticals out there, we heard it. The mantra was, well, "I have to do more with less. I have no money. There's cuts, cuts, cuts." But you never heard that in healthcare, except now you are hearing it in healthcare because so much money is getting uh, pushed toward meaningful use objectives, and it's really Indeed. shrinking other other IT budgets. So you, for the first time ever, healthcare is saying in IT, I have to do more with less. Another interesting thing that we, again, have seen across the U.S. and this this sweeping movement sort of is that healthcare has always been the laggard in technology. There's reasons for that. You have compliance issues you have to be concerned about, regulations and so forth, and you have so many legacy applications, and it's such a massive thing to change out those applications. So you tend to stay laggard in the industry. When it came to VDI, that was a good thing, because VDI was all the buzz five years ago. Again, because server virtualization kind of swept the industry by storm, and it was a good thing. It really did save money and, and, and created consolidation and, and all kinds of efficiencies. So it was the natural progression to think that if it works in server, it works in desktop. So let's do VDI. And so five years ago, when the technology wasn't mature enough to handle it, uh, every, a lot of people tried VDI and failed. So we saw across the board a lot of um, POCs that you know spun up with like 50 user P VDI POCs and then failed once they got to 100 or 200 because the technology just wasn't mature enough. So in that regard, thank God, healthcare is a laggard because you didn't jump on that CDI bandwagon. But now what we're seeing is that because of the need to save money and consolidate and provide a better user experience, virtual desktop technologies are finally being considered as something viable to consider. First time we're seeing that in healthcare. What do the providers need? Obviously, instant access to patient information at the point of care without having to remember multiple passwords, secure passwords, passwords that change every 30 days or something. It's, it's cumbersome, and, uh, and it takes away from the time that they're spending with the patients. What they also want, device and location in the, with a consistent experience. You probably saw it in your environment that you know if you go from a laptop to a desktop to a thin client to to a to a PDA device, it's a different experience every time you go on a different device. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it is. Exactly, and that's frustrating for the clinician because they're used to a, an icon being in one spot, and when it's not there and they have to hunt for it, there's more time taken away from them and, and adding to their frustration level. Uh, they need dictation integration. At the, at the end of the day, they just want more time with patients, and I get that. I love telling the story. I went to the Midwest Hymns Conference back in October, and it was in Milwaukee. And I had the good fortune of sitting in on one of the keynote addresses by Dr. Stephen Finn, and I'll never forget what he said. He's a practicing physician for the Veterans Administration. And, uh, you know, they're huge. They have, what, 2 million patients, and they serve, like, 800 hospitals across the whole U.S., and they do a marvelous job. 
and um, he said, and I quote, and I have his permission to quote him, my job as a practicing physician is 90% data management and 10% patient-facing care. Hmm. And he said, that has to amazing. change. It has to change. Amazing. Yep. Yeah, amazing. So we need to stand up and listen to that. As IT professionals, we need to do something about that. And then obviously, you know, from an IT perspective, uh, you, like you said already, your driving factor was in when you, the moment you realized you were failing your users, that became your driving mantra, is we have to enhance and improve the end user experience. That's what we're here to do as IT professionals. Uh, the other uh, part of that is managing all the different devices coming into the environment or the devices that they want to bring into the environment. And you mentioned it already, a way to optimize the desktop and the application delivery, again, with all the multiple applications that you're managing and legacy ones and so forth. And of course, security is always a concern. And again, reducing operation cost ties right back into the very top thing, financial challenges. Exactly. So um, that's kind of what we see across the whole U.S. And uh, do you see anything different, anything you would want to add to any of that? Uh, very similar here, of course. Uh, our providers have always long uh, complained about the number of passwords that they have to remember, the number of times they have to log in to access patient information or other applications, as the case may be. The time it takes to do that, all of those things are huge time users of a uh, clinician's time. And the ability to uh, reduce that significantly, if not eliminate it in, uh, to the extent possible, was a, a major driving factor for us in, in this project as well. Uh, we've heard over and over again that as providers come into the hospital and our various clinics and uh, other uh, care areas, they don't want to be tied down to a particular PC or a particular device. They want to be able to take that uh, that desktop with them, if you will, uh, wherever they wherever they go, and be able to pick up exactly where they left off. So if they want to start their day at home, uh, bringing up their patient list and looking at what they've got coming up for the day, come into the hospital, they want to be able to leave their home, turn left off, come into the hospital, to their office, um, wherever that may be, and pick up exactly where they left off. So device and location independence was another big one uh, for us to be able to meet uh, our providers' needs. A little bit later on, uh, we had another requirement come in, and that was uh, dictation. Uh, that's part of another project that's going on, but it was sort of an add-on to our whole uh, initial design, and that is adding a dictation requirement into the um, virtual clinical workstation as well, which actually set us back about a month, but um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But that was very, very important to the uh, workflow of our providers, so that as they're meeting patients, um, and it's actually a requirement uh, uh, of the uh, new health care laws that uh, that we get our, our doctors doing their, excuse me, doing their dictation uh, as quickly as, uh, as they possibly can. And so that's uh, integrating with our existing EMR was, was very, very important. Bottom line is, is uh, it gave us the, or gave us the ability to provide a seamless environment to our users. Um, minimizing their logins, minimizing the time to log in, and allowing them in the end to uh, to see more patients or spend more time with those patients as the case may be. Kind of a, a anecdotal uh, uh, comment I'd like to, to make here. When we were first in some early discussions with some of our providers and, and talking about VDI and, and uh, actually coming up with uh, trying to get uh, executive sponsorship for it and some, some budgeting numbers, we sat down with a couple of uh, our providers, and one of them uh, uh, was kind of an uh, interesting thing, uh, pulled out the proverbial napkin, literally a napkin, and began writing some numbers down on it. And uh, in his calculations, uh, based on the number of uh, hospitalists we have and, and, and uh, uh, other providers with hospital privileges, and the amount of time that they have to do every day, seeing patients, logging in and out, uh, he estimated uh, that the savings, if we could eliminate just the, the multiple passwords, the savings alone for the providers would uh, be in excess of, um, uh, well, let's just say it would be well into six figures in savings of time for those providers. And that's just a very small portion of our clinical workforce, obviously, uh, a few hundred providers as opposed to 3,000 plus other 
uh, clinical workers, including you know, nurses and therapists and so forth. So that was just an interesting, uh, interesting way of uh, uh, where our providers had a very vested interest in in seeing a project like what we ended up doing uh, be successful. And one of their key uh, requirements uh, for that to be successful in their eyes is to reduce those logins and, and save them the time so they can see more patients every day. Um, like everything else, we're not uh, we're not getting much more staff. We are um, seeing more uh, more patients and and having to figure out how we're going to do that with the existing staff we have. So interesting the the nap, nap, uh, napkin analogy there. It was it was uh, <laughs> sat down with my director one day and then he told me that story and I said yeah it makes sense to me because that's what we're coming up with on the back end as well as we were sitting down and, and looking at the providers and the number of hours and time spent uh, logging into all these different applications and, and we had come up with a very similar number as well. So wow. And so that number was a time factor, but then extrapolate that to the right. money it's, savings. Exactly. It's all soft costs. Yeah. So you can't point and say we're going to save the hospital X number of dollars, but we are. We can point to it as a soft cost and say, you know, that physician today can see five patients, but after this they can see six patients a day. You know, that's, that, that's a, a big uh, benefit to the hospital yeah. financially in the end. Yeah. And uh, and more quality time and not so rushed or, or frustrated. Exactly. Right. That's huge. Okay, so let's talk about what you. Um, so again, we're kind of walking through this journey, and uh, so it started to take shape a little bit. And so part of it was defining your key solution requirements or key solution or key success criteria, basically. So let's talk about that. Yep. So uh, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, anywhere, any device access, and that literally is anywhere in any device. Uh, we don't. We intended to design our solution around uh, a device agnosticity. We we didn't care how you were coming in. We just needed to make sure that whatever we were delivering uh, was available to that user, whether it's on a smartphone, whether it's on a tablet, an iPad, a uh, netbook, laptop whatever the case may be, it didn't matter to us uh, because the user was going to dictate how they wanted to access their patient records um, uh, from, from their device. And it needed to be anywhere. We needed to make sure that uh, it didn't matter if they were at their house, they were on a, uh, a Munson network, if they were on the golf course, if they were out on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever get rid of our ice, <laughs> and the lake clear up, uh, we're, we don't have to worry about it being a uh, icebreaker. Um, wherever wherever they were, if they were on vacation, uh, we wanted them to be able to reach their patients if they needed to be reached, uh, and be able to be effective at that. So that was a, a very major uh, component for us: is the anywhere any device access, and the experience had to be consistent. We couldn't see performance issues from device to device. Uh, it had to be uh, the same regardless of how that user was accessing um, their application. Uh, we also had to make sure that um, that we had to make uh, ensure that the password, whatever the methodology was that we wanted to provide uh, the users to remove that password uh, issue was secure. And finally, from a uh, automated standpoint, the user needed to be able to see the same uh, session, the same personalization that they may have done with their uh, desktop um, and have that room with the user from, from place to place. In other words, we didn't want the user to log in one day and see a desktop, personalize it, and then a few days later log in and see something completely different that wasn't uh, the way they had set it up originally. So that was very important for us as well. It gave the user some uh, some, person, uh, some ownership over the, the desktop, sets it up the way they wanted to be set up for their workflows, um, and, we, and, and they can go and then take that desktop wherever they wanted. It needed to be easy to manage, and that really pointed to some kind of a virtual desktop. So what that really uh, would look like, we weren't completely sure yet. For us, we... Uh, we, we had both, and still do for that matter, uh, have a VMware environment and is in a server environment. So we had a couple of different hypervisors that we could look at, and we actually looked at a third, uh, and that's uh, Hyper-V from, from Microsoft, since we're a big Microsoft shop as well. So we evaluated all three hypervisors from a uh, desktop environment and, 
ended up settling down on using VMware as our hypervisor of choice, but using Zen Desktop as our and Zen App as our means of delivering a virtual desktop. And then the third thing that it needed to be uh, uh, a key requirement is it had to be cost justifiable. And that's apart from the soft costs. Um, in our environment, uh, we need to show a hard cost um, return on investment, if you will. And so that took some time uh, because in any uh, um, project like this where we're putting in a virtual desktop and we're changing the, the desktop environment itself, uh, there are a, quite a few upfront costs. Um, it could, there could be storage costs, there are server costs, there is so, certainly a lot of software costs. And then uh, depending on the, the skill set of the uh, IT staff itself, there's, there could very well be uh, consultant uh, costs as well. All of this to uh, deliver a new desktop to a group of users who already have a desktop, but that desktop isn't necessarily working for them. So the cost justification really took some time. And I think that was one of the, uh, the probably the second largest or second biggest issue we had from the very beginning where it took so long for us to get to the point where we're at today. And that is not only was the technology really wasn't mature enough for what we wanted it to do, but the cost uh, was you know, more expensive than what we could possibly justify in terms of return on investment in any reasonable, um, any reasonable uh, time frame uh, for our uh, finance and accounting folks. So uh, those were some uh, major requirements for any solution that we uh, needed to uh, or were needed to be able to support to our administrative staff uh, before we could even uh, go forward with a, with a project like this. So have you uh, finished out those ROI calculations and have you figured out like a payback time and years or anything like that knowing that you like we mentioned in the beginning, you can elongate the refresh cycle, you can use less devices, or are you still kind of working through some of those? A lot things? of it we're still working through. Um, we were fortunate that we had strong support from our hospitalists uh, that saw the value in a virtual clinical workstation environment. And even without um, a hard return, were able to help us champion the uh, the notion to our administrative staff uh, decision makers, and so we never really had to come up with a final ROI. But our rough calculations do show that we're looking at somewhere between three and five years, you know, based on you know, extending the hardware uh, cycle for our desktop, significant reductions in our software costs. Um, really very, very large and uh, from our Microsoft licensing uh, requirements uh, and the way we presented our, our desktop to our user, we were able to significantly reduce our ongoing costs with that. So uh, between those two major factors as well as uh, uh, on, the, on the back end side, the, uh, we re are eliminating our Zen server environment and, and completely moving to a VMware environment, we're able to kind of uh, better manage and reduce the management costs of having two different uh, hypervisors in, in place. Certainly the Zen server is, is kind of a, a, a free thing from Citrix since we're, we're licensed for Zen app and, and so forth, but, um, and Zen desktop for that matter. But the fact that we had to manage two different environments uh, was, again, another staffing thing. And, right. uh, and uh, since we're in a time like a lot of other places are with hospitals uh, looking to reduce headcount, um, we're in the same boat as well. We're reducing headcount uh, as we speak, and um, reducing that management uh, from multiple systems is just another way of, um, of saving some cost for us. So we're looking three to five years rough. Okay. Bottom line. All right. So from there, the vision starts to take shape. So you mentioned this already. So we're looking at virtual options. Um, <clears throat> I do want to mention that you looked at uh, you were considering a single vendor option specifically from your uh, EMR vendor, because mm -hmm. a lot of them offer that. And, um, but probably the drawback with that approach would be that uh, it wouldn't be as all-encompassing. Right. right. Um, and that, that's a good point. We, we had visited some other hospitals and seen how they had done some implementations similar to what we were looking at from a virtual clinical workstation environment. And one of the ones that was very attractive and one that uh, uh, our 
one of our directors brought back to the table was the single vendor option where our EMR vendor, which uh, uh, would provide a clinical workstation for us that was focused strictly on the EMR. And uh, that would have been a, uh, it's an attractive solution. It's relatively uh, quick, um, not a particularly expensive one, although there's uh, certainly some costs associated with it. But it is a single vendor solution, and it only meets the needs of um, a very small group of, of users who may not use anything but that EMR. And we had a bigger vision, uh, and that goes back to what I had mentioned earlier, where we want a desktop that a user, a clinician, can take with them wherever they go and be completely functional uh, from, uh, from an office perspective. So uh, not only was the EMR important uh, to be available in the uh, virtual clinical workstation, but other supporting applications that the clinician may use needed to be there and available as well. And that just doesn't include just your Microsoft Office products uh, like Word and Excel and Outlook and so forth, but it also includes any other of the clinical applications we have. We have, we're, like any other hospital, we have you know uh, dozens of them literally, and many of those needed to be available to our uh, to our staff to be truly functional. And so that's what we wanted to provide: a full desktop solution that a user could take with them wherever they wanted to go. So, uh, so that really eliminated the single vendor solution for us pretty quickly um, out of the box. Uh, we did look at a lot of different virtual options, um, and that doesn't uh, include just um, uh, the hypervisor itself, but it also includes uh, things like our storage. What are we going to do for storage, and how are we going to provision that? Um, what are we looking at performance from a storage perspective? What uh, what do we do? If we do full private desktops, what is that going to look like uh, on our, our storage arrays? Uh, what is the software going to be that uh, provides that user personalization that they take with them from place to place, from desktop to desktop, as, as they go and, and log in uh, each day? How is that going to be uh, a player? And then what are the other things uh, like the password? How are we going to manage passwords? So what's the tool or software or application going to be that does that? What's the appliance going to look like? How is that going to fit into our environment? Uh, we are a, um, just so everybody knows, we are a major Citrix shop here. Uh, that's what we build our, our EMRs around, as, as well as many other folks. So how can we leverage that? We're a big VMware shop. How do we leverage that? How do we tie the two environments together? How do we tie Citrix together, uh, Citrix and VMware together to provide an environment without standing up multiple hypervisors or, or different technologies for different things? So, uh, so that's really where the vision, the vision, if you will, began to uh, to form is is uh, is looking at all of those different components that would make up a clinical workstation, from storage, from servers, from hypervisor, uh, desktop delivery, password management, uh, and uh, and personalization of that user experience. Where, uh, where was that going to take us and what was that going to look like? And so that's kind of where uh, we began engaging with uh, a number of different vendors, uh, Cortec included, to help us uh, sort of um, finalize that, uh, that look and feel of what that desktop would might, uh, might look like. And so um, we began looking at use cases and developing some use cases uh, in the environment, uh, spending a lot of time working with our clinical staff, uh, different ones, whether they're from the nursing side of things, whether they're from the hospitalists or from uh, our therapists, RTs, respiratory therapists, occupational therapy, lab, radiology. Uh, we even had our business office included as well, even though the, this particular project focused strictly on the clinical side. We wanted a business office to give us their input because if we extend this further past the clinical environment, we want to have that knowledge uh, available to us of what they may be looking at uh, from, from a virtual workstation. What are their needs going to be and how might they differ uh, from a clinical workstation and how might they be similar? Uh, another um, requirement we had from uh, our senior management staff was to make sure that whatever we ended up designing for this clinical workstation, we didn't design ourselves in a box, into a box, or into a corner, well. 
And so the design had to be open and flexible enough to be able to take on new uh, or emerging requirements uh, even as we were rolling things out. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit um, because that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, case that, uh, that happened not too long after we began our, our full rollout. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we ended up settling um, on a solution from Cortec um, that sort of tied all that uh, all that together, and uh, and we began that back in June of uh, of last year, and actually we began it even earlier than that. Uh, the assessment phase took place in uh, March April of uh, last year, so just a year ago, and then uh, we began the full scale development of the solution in late May early June. Um, and uh, move forward very, very rapidly thereafter. Yes, we did. I think we were, you were one of the fastest implementations. You and the, some other folks in Chicago are kind of tied for that. That's one of the <laughs> fastest implementations we've ever done. It was all hands on deck sort of thing. It certainly was. <laughs> and we pulled it off. It was, it was good. We did, yes. We did, barely. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about what the back end looked sure. like then. Um, so again, let me talk about this from a core tech perspective. So when we build these, these virtual clinical solutions for our clients, this is not a cookie cutter sort of thing. This is, uh, you know, we take into account what you might already have in the environment and we leverage whatever we can based on the use cases and, and the end goal that you want to get to. So in your particular instance, you had some F5s in the environment, if I remember, and we replaced those with the uh, net scalers. No, we did not. ASAs, we, had, we, had, right? uh, we had eight load balancers. That's the what we load balancers. Yeah. So we took those out. We put in the, the net scalers, the SDX 11500s, and there's actually four of those because mm -hmm. you have two data centers, so we have right. two in each. So we're, we're, we, um, we're doing the load balancing, the global server load balancing across those right. data centers. All right, so we also have a Zen desktop, which is serving up uh, the virtual desktop 7 for the higher end use cases, and then Zen app 6.5, which is uh, serving up the published desktop and the published applications for the standard use cases. I want to sit there for a second. Sure. So again, in looking at the use cases and determining that about 80% of the clinical use cases would be perfectly served by a pub desktop as opposed to a a pure BDI desktop gave us high user densities which drove down the cost. Tremendously, yeah, uh, and that's what we saw as well, and it's still true today is our published desktop uh, running on, on ZenApp provides everything that almost all of our clinical workers need on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which we didn't, weren't sure of going in. We, we thought we'd have a higher mix of our virtual desktops, our uh, Zen desktop, if you will, private desktops. But the published desktop proved true in when we did our first uh, rollout in August that we met every single one of the needs of our clinical workers, both providers, nurses, respiratory therapists, occupational. All of those were social workers uh, that were roaming uh, through the hospital. Uh, we had every application virtual in our Zen app environment, which uh, was, was great for us. And as a couple of that sense, we were able to give them the personalization that you wouldn't normally get out exactly. of the box on a published desktop. Exactly, yep. Uh, and so that personalization then follows those users around and we give them exactly what they need. They see the same thing every day that they log in. If they made any changes to their desktop, it's there. Um, so it's a great uh, user satisfier, as well, for, uh, for that personalization. So yeah, it's been down to apps then. Uh, so since it's also the piece that gave you the application license compliance, yep metering that allowed you to reduce your other software. Right, costs. and that's uh, very briefly, I'll just, uh, we were uh, last May, April, May time frame, we were renegotiating our enterprise agreement with Microsoft and uh, part of that uh, renegotiation involved our use of AppSense in our ZenApp environment and using AppSense to manage the uh, licensing compliance of our Microsoft products, uh, Office and you know, Visio and every one of the other project and all the other um, office products that we are, are licensed to use. And so by leveraging AppSense, using AppSense uh, from the uh, application licensing metering uh, standpoint where we can you know, target particular groups with, uh, with access or not to, to office products, 
we were able to uh, convince Microsoft that we didn't need the number of licenses actually uh, had been licensed for and reduce that count by a very significant amount uh, that uh, made a uh, made a big difference in our enterprise agreement and allowed us to do some other things with those funds instead of buying multiple Microsoft <laughs> licenses for people who never use it. Um, you can imagine, and I'm sure you do, in a, in a nursing unit, for instance, where you have any number of, of PCs, the chances of nurses using Microsoft uh, on all of those PCs at the same time is pretty low. So virtualizing that uh, and, then, uh, and then managing it from an absence standpoint made a huge amount of uh, sense to us from a cost perspective. One of my favorite technologies, actually, AppSense. I call it the Swiss Army knife. Yes, it does a lot. <laughs> it does a lot. And we use it for a lot, yes. <laughs> it's also included a solution that's Improvada One Sign, which gives mm -hmm. you the single sign-on. It gives you the authentication management. And what I mean by that is that's the uh, that's the badge tap brokering mm -hmm. that gives you the security and the speed, uh, which you guys are using uh, passive proxy reader. Right. The same solution could also use fingerprint readers or active uh, readers, or, but passive property is what we see. Um, what you need in a hospital environment, it just needs to work 100% of the time, right. and that technology does. And it does. Improvada has been solid for us uh, from the day we put it in. Absence uh, has, has, has as well. Um, so we've been very, very happy with both technologies. The Improvada one side has been wonderful. The users absolutely love it. Being able to take their um, a hospital issued ID badge and app a reader and gain access to their desktop almost instantly is, is wonderful and it's really beginning to take hold in the hospital as well even uh, it's been six months or eight months now that we begin rolling out our staff are finally beginning to realize that they can take their desktop as they want they were so used to camping out on a on a PC if you will, um, and, and start their ship log into a PC and just stay there because it's so long to again <laughs> to another one. They didn't want to do that. And now that they realize that their their badges, they can take that desktop with them and in ten seconds they're they're back to exactly where they left off. Um, it really is becoming uh, very, very popular to our to our nursing staff and others. Isn't it funny old habits take so long? And it did, it really did. Uh, and and users still even when we tap them out, uh, and we call it tap and go. I think I mentioned that at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, uh, we take for short, tap and go. So when we first put this uh, virtual clinical workstation in a couple of nursing units, uh, our nurses would uh, sometimes kind of freak out, for lack of a better word, <laughs> if we saw a session open and we tapped. And it, it began to catch on that as soon as they badged back in, uh, tapped back in, and their workstation came back up exactly where they left it off, uh, they were beginning to become more comfortable with that. But it's a learning experience. It's a habit-changing uh, situation. And it's slowly taking uh, effect throughout our hospitals now. In a way. good way. Yes, in a good way. Okay, so all I want to hear from a core tech perspective is that in your instance, we ended up using uh, Citrix to serve up those VDI desktops because Correct, yes. we could um, make effective use of the published desk and therefore a lot of costs on the back end. Uh, but we can all build this on view, and, and I think we considered it. Or, uh, we did. We considered view early and decided that we have so much experience with our Zen app that we, we may sense to leverage Zen app and Zen desktop as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and just one quick uh, additional thing, uh, all of our Citrix stuff is, except for a handful of Zen servers which we're in the process of retiring, all of our Citrix stuff moved over to VMware as a hypervisor choice. So we have one hypervisor now. And uh, and I, I fear that we're going to go over a little bit because yep. we're talking so much, but um, is there a reason why you settled on uh, VMware for your hypervisor as opposed to Hyper-V? Like what, what was the turning the, the point there? We were ready. Uh, at, we felt that Hyper-V in the 2012 version of a 2012 server is, may very well be competitive to VMware. We weren't completely ready for it as part of this project. We had, mm -hmm. we wanted to leverage the experience we had, and that is with Citrix and it's with VMware. And sense. rather than introducing a brand new technology, Hyper-V, even though it's built into the server, for those who, who know that um, on the Microsoft side, we just weren't comfortable spinning up an entire brand new hypervisor just to uh, implement our uh, clinical workstation environment. Sounds like a lot of wisdom in that decision, one thing at a time. 
All right, so the implementation success factors, once, you know, if you build it, they will come. And uh, so here we are at that point now. We rolled it out. We got first the pilot rolled out. What would you say were the implementation success factors from your perspective? From our perspective, it's obviously is, is what's here on the, on the, on the, uh, on the slide, and that's communicating. Uh, we spent a ton of time communicating. I and uh, others uh, from CoreTech uh, and, and our IT staff spent many days uh, in uh, the first couple of units that we rolled out the political workstation to, making sure that we we're addressing any issues that came up, uh, uncovering things that we hadn't caught in testing, retesting, uh, 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 correcting those, those issues. We had a command center set up for the first month or so that, uh, that we had staff with at least one person in it that would handle the phone calls that would be coming in and then uh, portion them out to the right people to uh, take care of immediately. So we kind of bypassed the help desk uh, function. And then we had a ton of vendor support. Uh, Cortec uh, provided staff uh, to help us with the uh, first week, uh, first two weeks of go live, uh, both in the clinical units as well as on the back end, uh, supporting our our uh, project team as uh, we work through some issues. So, so those are some of the things. A uh, couple of things that uh, we found out that we would want to do better, very briefly, is. Uh, uh, don't uh, make sure your storage and your infrastructure is in place before you actually begin rolling this uh, and, and building the solution. In our particular case, not only were we negotiating with Microsoft in our enterprise agreement, but we're also in our, uh, negotiating for a brand new storage platform. Uh, and we ended up settling on EMC. But that took so long in the process that uh, in our build, uh, and because we didn't have storage space uh, to build out the final version of our clinical workstation environment, we actually ended up building it three times. Uh, and uh, so uh, as we built it in one place, we'd move it then to another, and finally we moved it to the final place. And in fact, we didn't have our storage in place until about, uh, I think it was one or maybe two weeks before go live. Wow. Um, so we were scrambling all the way up to the very end. And that's one of the biggest takeaways that we, we had with this is, uh, and some of the problems that we ended up having during the rollout and, and a little bit afterwards is some performance issues and some stability issues and some build issues. Just uh, standardization on our build uh, was was not very well controlled from a project standpoint. So those are some of the issues. Back-end issues that uh, the user don't, doesn't see necessarily, but things we needed to correct uh, later on before we could really go into a wider scale rollout. So all I'd want to underscore there is, again, what we've seen across the U.S. when we do these implementations is how critical the command center and the vendor support is. Because when you're rolling something out new to the users, you need their acceptance level to be high in the beginning if it's going to catch on to the rest of the user community. And being able to address any issue that is uncovered very quickly um, goes a long way in, in gaining their acceptance of any new systems that you put in front of them. Yep, it's absolutely great to have executive sponsorship and, and so forth, but when you first roll anything out, uh, and I'm sure everybody out there listening will agree, if the users don't accept it, it's going to get around the organization pretty quickly and it's going to make your job that much more difficult. Exactly. So that first group has got to be uh, done very well and, and are key to uh, evangelizing the product as well. Absolutely. All right. So at the end of the day, so let's talk about the quote here. Over 80% provider satisfaction rating, and, and we only have four minutes left to kind of wrap this up. But um, we started with saying, in the very beginning, you realized you were failing your users. And so the key driving force here was to improve and enhance that the user experience. And so that was one of the first metrics that you did a survey against after you had this rolled out. And you were pretty pleased with those results. Yeah, we were. We surveyed uh, the first couple of units, nursing units, that we had rolled out. Um, probably about 150 staff, or 150 to 200 staff altogether. And we were very pleased with the results. Um, as the quote, about 80% were, were satisfied or very satisfied with the, uh, with the workstation uh, as we had deployed it. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback from the users in some of the comments that they had made on how we could make it better, how we could make it uh, uh, more responsive to the users, and we've incorporated many of those changes over the last few months uh, into that uh, desktop environment. So uh, that in rollout, 
even as rushed as it was uh, when you look at June, July and rolling out our first group in uh, about 200 users in August, um, uh, the users themselves were, were engaged all along uh, in the whole process and making sure that, that we were delivering exactly what they did. Uh, we had the management staff from those units uh, involved. We had the charge nurses. We had unit clerks uh, all sitting in our test lab working through that desktop with us side by side to make sure that that, that virtual uh, clinical desktop was what exa exactly what they needed as well as our providers too. So I think that speaks well to getting that 80% uh, uh, satisfaction rating uh, right out of the box. So what's next? So it's kind of interesting. What's next for you folks is kind of, again, very indicative of what we see across the United States that everybody else is kind of looking at at the same time. Uh, so we mentioned the, you know, a consistent experience regardless of device, which means there's more there's more devices out there to manage now, right? So that's Just a why, few, yeah. <laughs> so that's why mobile device management is now something to uh, to be concerned about and looking at. Um, a secure pull printing. So we did look at some of that in the POC environment already uh, with Jet Mobile specifically. We're looking at some other ways to accomplish the same thing. What we mean by that is, um, let's say you. Um, uh, uh, print something instead of it sitting on the printer somewhere and not remembering which printer you left it on, whatever. Uh, secure pull printing means we put some sort of a device or code, whatever, on those network printers. So when you print, you don't care where you're printing it to. It's just going off to the cloud. And then when you're ready to grab it, you walk up to any printer, tap your badge, or put in your code, and boom, there's your, your print job waiting for you. Uh, the next thing we're looking at with you folks are uh, thin and zero mm -hmm. clients. And uh, more than displays, too. I think we're looking at some HP devices there, but we'll be testing yep. those out. Yep, so things we're looking at there. Uh, alternate tablet devices. And the next thing is going on to the next use case, which is uh, private or the, the virtual. The Zen desktop. Private yeah. desktop is, as we call it, for our staff so they understand what it is. Uh, and that is, even though we have a private desktop available for some users, we really uh, see a need to expand that into some other areas, especially in places where uh, we can't virtualize uh, the application itself for whatever reason or it doesn't work correctly in a Citrix environment, um, FB or whatever the case may be. So we see some uh, some additional use cases coming up very soon in the private, for, for a private desktop. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited too because we're talking about some other very specific automated workflows. And again, because your Sterner is hosted locally, we have a little bit more um, control over some of the cool things that we we can do. So we're actually going into some further talks about some uh, some fun workflows that we can do. Yep, that's one of the next things about us hosting our own EMR is the ability to do some of those things that uh, we couldn't do in our if we were a remote hosting site. Absolutely, your hands end up being really tied. So I I wish we had way more time to talk because this has been a lot of fun, and I'm trying to get to. Uh, I think I lost control of my screen. Here we go. Here we go. So all I can say, Dale, is that for the past couple of years, this whole journey with you has been a complete pleasure for the whole Cortec team. We really enjoy working with your team. Um, you're my favorite customer. I say that to everybody. <laughs> I say <that> to everybody, <laughs> right. <laughs> I do. Everybody knows Dale's my favorite. <laughs> so anyway, we appreciate the working relationship that we have the collaboration that we have together, and especially you taking time out of your day for something like this. We really, really appreciate it. And I know the folks on the screen appreciate it, too. So, I appreciate the comments. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, so uh, like we said, we're, uh, so Cortec is going to be at uh, Improvada HealthCon in Boston, May 3rd to the 5th. We're going to have demos set up where you can see the solution in action. We're doing multiple road shows across the whole United States. That's listed on our uh, events page on our Cortec Services website. And for more information, we'll leave this screen up for about the next five or ten minutes so you can jot down these phone numbers and email addresses. Feel free to email Dale and myself. And uh, like I said at the beginning, we're going to be sending out the case study uh, to everybody that registered for the event day. And we'll also, when it's ready, because it's going to take a little bit of time, send out an email with a link to the re today's recording on the Cortex website. And um, we are out of time. I don't see any questions out there. I I think we covered it, and if not, uh, if questions come in later, we'll just do uh, round two on another day. Sounds good. And if anybody does, as is out there uh, has any questions, absolutely feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'd be more than happy to spend some time with you talking a little bit more about our experience if you have anything specific you want to talk about. 
Awesome. Thank you again, Dale. Really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.